Good evening, I'm Andrew Chang. Adrian is away. Tonight, health care systems across the country on the brink as an Ontario community mourns the death of a 13-year-old girl. I'm thinking that it's, you know, she's still around and in my mind, right? I can't, I can't imagine what he's going through. How Emily's death has become a rallying cry, while Ontario, caught in a capacity crisis, calls in the military. Cases are rising and uh, they don't really seem to be uh, one in sight. Inching towards catastrophe in Fort McMurray, declaring a state of emergency as the ICU fills up. Now is the time to get serious. And another daily record in Nova Scotia, a province on edge and locked down as officials try to stamp out the spread. Also tonight, Apple moves to protect your data. This is something that privacy advocates have been asking for for years. Why it's setting up a clash of the tech titans and... Oh, people around the world making post-pandemic plans. This is The National. Well, so much of the story of this pandemic is in the details, the numbers and graphs that we show you every night and will again tonight that illustrate how it's evolving. But every once in a while, one of those details just stops you in your tracks and serves as a reminder that this pandemic, at its very core, is about people. Like 13-year-old Emily Victoria Viegas from Brampton, Ontario, who got sick with COVID-19 as the virus tore through her community and who just days ago died with the virus. Now, it is incredibly rare for someone so young to die of this disease, and it happened in one of Ontario's hotspots, just as the province was turning to the military for help. As Ellen Morrow shows us, Emily's death has devastated those close to her and shocked the country. Emily Victoria Villegas loved the movie Frozen and teasing her dad. Pino Panza is a family friend. I'm thinking that it's, you know, she's still around and in my mind, right? I can't, I can't imagine what he's going through. I can't imagine what he's going through. Carlos Villegas desperately tried to treat his daughter at home, another family friend said. His wife was already in ICU, also battling COVID. Emily's condition deteriorated rapidly. After being found unresponsive, Viegas was rushed to this hospital in Brampton, where she died. The city is one of the hardest hit in Canada. The 13-year-old's death advocates say a tragic symbol of a pandemic still raging and a community under-supported. None of us can imagine what Mr. Viegas had to go through, what Emily's family is going through right now. And the most terrible part is that we're seeing deaths play out every day. There was a moment of silence for Viegas in the House of Commons. Another at Queen's Park, the Ontario government under pressure to redirect vaccines to the worst affected regions. How many more deaths will it take before the Conservative government give Brampton the support we need? Emily's death is truly a, a tragedy. However, we all need to remember that we are working as hard as we can to bring vaccinations to as many people as possible. With ICUs and healthcare workers under ever increasing strain, today the first patient moved into the field hospital at Toronto Sunnybrook, while Ontario revealed it's asked the military for help. What we are looking for is very specialized uh, nurses that can help out in our intensive care unit beds um, and medical personnel that can assist our um, hospitals. Panza hopes Viegas' death won't be in vain. We really got to do a better job of staying safe. If we don't do it all together, it's never going to pass. And there might be another teenage uh, girl or boy that passed away. A loss no family should have to bear. Now, Ellen, can we talk a little more about that military support coming to Ontario? What details do you have there? Well, Andrew, it's going to start first thing tomorrow morning. The Royal Canadian Air Force will be flying medical personnel from Newfoundland and Labrador here to Toronto to help relieve healthcare workers who've just been under incredible pressure with ICU admissions so high here and case counts high in Ontario as well. The Canadian Armed Forces will also be deploying three medical assistance teams of 10 to 12 people. So support is on the way, much needed support, but the fact that it's necessary, Andrew, just like Emily Lee Viegas' tragic death at 13 years old are both signs of just how dire the situation has become here in Ontario. Okay, Ellen Morrow in Toronto tonight. Thanks. Health officials in British Columbia have confirmed that the death of a baby in January was related to COVID-19. 
This is, of course, the youngest of uh, death that we have had, tragically, in our province from COVID-19. Dr. Bonnie Henry says the infant was being treated at BC Children's Hospital. The province recorded 17 more coronavirus deaths over the weekend, including the first nurse to die of COVID-19 complications in that province. Now, there is growing concern about the burden on Alberta's health care system tonight. The province is struggling to tamp down its third wave today, recording nearly 1,500 new COVID-19 cases. And in the regional municipality of Wood Buffalo, which includes the city of Fort McMurray, worry is especially high. It is the part of Alberta with the highest number of active COVID cases per capita and only limited hospital capacity to deal with it. So as Carolyn Dunn explains, it is declaring a state of local emergency and asking the province for one specific thing. With their municipality declaring a local state of emergency, the desire to get a vaccine feels a bit more urgent for some in Fort McMurray today. Well, it's a concern, obviously, right? Um, the cases are rising and uh, it don't really seem to be uh, end in sight, to be honest. So, yeah, yeah, definitely concerning. A couple of months before, we have only 40 cases in Fort McMurray, but now it's about 1,000 cases, so the ratio going high day by day. And that's putting an unprecedented strain on the local hospital. Dozens of surgeries were cancelled today. 31 hospitalized COVID patients have its ICU over capacity and a full COVID unit spilling over onto other wards. Council will table emergency measure recommendations tomorrow, but today it's asking for more vaccines. But the province says vaccine uptake in Wood Buffalo has been much lower than in most parts of Alberta. So the Premier says extra doses may not be the answer. Uh, the supply is there. It's just that um, maybe, it, maybe the, the clinics and pharmacies have not been um, so convenient enough for folks. Uh, maybe there continues to be an issue of vaccine hesitancy in some of the surrounding First Nations. Those are issues that we have to work through. So Kenny says it's likely there will be increased focus on getting vaccines out to the people, including oil sand camps in the region, where thousands of workers fly in and out of Alberta on rotations. I absolutely believe that a lot of the convening that's going on between uh, Fort McMurray and other parts of the nation is a great contributor to this increase in uh, 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 COVID uh, infections. A state of local emergency brought in last year allowed the region to close businesses and restrict the flow of people. Municipal and Indigenous leaders will meet with the province tomorrow before they decide what this one will look like. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Calgary. And coming up, I'll speak to the leaders of two of Canada's hardest hit communities, Brampton, Ontario and Wood Buffalo, Alberta, about what they need right now. Manitoba is imposing new restrictions to deal with the rapid rise in cases there. Today, the seven-day average of daily new cases reached 223. That's nearly double what it was last week. I think these numbers prove that these measures are necessary. And of course, they take time to work. We all know that. But we've done this before and we need to do it again now. He mentioned new measures. They include no visitors at private residences, no indoor gatherings, and a limit on outdoor dining to groups of no more than four people. The new, outdoor, uh, the new orders rather, take effect midnight on Wednesday and last at least four weeks. Well, there are new restrictions in Nova Scotia as well, where a record 63 infections yesterday was topped today by another 66 and cases have spread from Halifax to all parts of the province. As Kayla Hounsell tells us, there is concern about what the healthcare system can handle. This hockey game in Cape Breton last Saturday is now considered a high-risk exposure site. Brent DeVoe was there. I'm in isolation till next Sunday. I had my first test yesterday. I got my result this morning and I'm negative, thank God. But the risk is considered so high, he still has to stay in isolation for a full two weeks. It uh, kind of puts it into, into perspective. I mean, I think most people think that, ah, it can't, it can't hit me, right? But you know what? It's reality. We've been pretty lucky in Cape Breton overall. That new concern in Cape Breton is part of the reason the government is implementing province-wide restrictions. Uh, this is a deadly disease, and this time around, this variant is wreaking havoc in our neighboring provinces, and we need to make sure that we're stopping that spread. To do that, schools in the Halifax area will close. Office buildings have emptied out, rush hour traffic non-existent. And no matter where they live, people are being asked not to leave their communities. 
But Nova Scotia had been doing so well. Stores were open at 100% capacity, restaurants open for dining in. And it really just goes to show how quickly such a new threat can uh, get into a province and spread rather quickly without restrictions in place. 66 cases in one day may not seem like a lot, but this province is small and officials here have always said they act quickly because the healthcare system doesn't have the capacity to handle COVID the way bigger provinces can. If you're still being careless about your COVID protocols, now is the time to get serious. Strang says he is watching Cape Breton closely to determine whether the virus is spreading. The boss is the, is, is, is the virus itself. We can do all we want, but you know what? We can't control a virus. But Nova Scotia has kicked COVID out before, and health officials are calling on people to step up again. They say this outbreak is a wake-up call to take the new variant seriously. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Halifax. Now let's turn to the north where the B117 variant, first detected in the UK, was confirmed in Iqaluit today. Nunavut health officials call the situation serious but under control. Current research shows that the Moderna vaccine is effective against this variant, so I urge people to continue making appointments and getting their vaccines. Nunavut has started sending all of its positive COVID-19 test results south to check for variants, and as of today, all 21 have come back positive for the B117 variant, which suggests it might now be the territory's dominant strain. Now, Nunavut's vaccination rate is far above the national average, but things are picking up across the country. As of today, 12 million doses have been administered, with almost a million Canadians now fully vaccinated, having received both doses. Health officials say that will accelerate in the coming weeks with the expected arrival of millions more doses. And right now, it is Canada's oldest and most vulnerable people who are reaping some of the biggest benefits of the vaccine rollout. A CBC News analysis shows rates of infection, hospitalization and deaths are plummeting in that cohort. And as Lauren Pelly explains, that is bringing much needed hope in a time of darkness. After months of getting shots in arms across the country, a CBC News analysis shows those efforts are starting to pay off. During the second wave, the rate of COVID-19 cases among the oldest seniors and youngest adults was roughly the same. But as more people over 80 got the shot, cases dropped sharply among that age group, even as those among younger Canadians started to spike in the third wave. High rates of vaccination among long-term care residents had an even more noticeable effect, with deaths in that group plummeting. It is good news that these vaccines work. Uh, and they're protecting some of the more vulnerable people throughout this pandemic. But medical experts say the next group of vaccine recipients needs to be just as targeted as the third wave rages. If we want to ramp down the cases, we really have to ramp up the vaccination in the younger groups. And in particular, vaccination in hotspots is a priority. All set? <laughs> One of those hot spots is here in northwest Toronto, where everyone over 18 is allowed to get vaccinated. At this apartment complex, a local vaccination team is going door to door. When we can create the biggest difference by doing mobile clinics where we have the greatest rates of COVID, I think we're finally getting to the root source of things. A few blocks away, young adults wait in line at a pop-up vaccination site, including 21-year-old Angel Ofbara, who just recovered from COVID-19 herself. I hope we can return to a sense of normalcy, I would say, like, after a while. Or fairly soon. If at least three quarters of Canadians get their first shot in the next few months, lockdown restrictions in hard-hit regions could be lifted over the summer, says Canada's chief public health officer. But even then, you have to be cautious. Cautious, but shot by shot, more hopeful. Lauren Pelly, CBC News, Toronto. So, when they're in arms, the vaccines are doing their jobs. But across Ontario, frustration is growing over confusing, even contradictory booking procedures. Thomas Daigle looks at the hoops people eager to get the shot have to jump through and the worry that it's turning people off. It can be a long, winding road finding a vaccine appointment. And in Toronto, this is how far some have to commute once their shot is booked. There's a lot of confusion and... My biggest worry is that people will revert back to not wanting to take the vaccine. Just take Parkdale, 
a neighborhood where everyone 18 and up has been promised a first dose soon. Except the designated clinics are a full hour away on public transit and slots are hard to come by. I'm someone who's willing to make that that call and just, just jump on a, a, a bus and get there. You know, imagine you don't have that luxury. The wait time just went up. Nicole Jankowski had the time and technology needed to wait in an hour long virtual queue, though to no avail. It just feels very anticlimactic. The Ontario government decentralized registration, leaving the province, public health units, pharmacies and hospitals all with distinct booking tools. I know that can sound confusing to people, but that is the system the province has in place right now. Compare that to Nova Scotia with its one-stop portal for all who qualify. Sure, Toronto is bigger and more diverse, but it took this doctor to create a booking guide on his own. If you don't have internet access because you can't afford it, or you have just have difficulty navigating, a lot of those people um, are going to have a lot of difficulty getting vaccines right now. Some working from home have been setting alarms when new appointments are supposed to open. Others watching the online vaccine hunters group for alerts like this one in Ottawa. Jumped out of bed and got in the car and raced down. She wasn't alone as a single tweet generated more demand than available doses. For many though, Twitter is not an option with a long wait at a pop-up clinic, the only alternative. It almost feels like you're disenfranchising these people from getting the vaccine like you would for getting concert tickets, except there's much more at stake here. He's treated three patients who gave up on booking and then got COVID. That's the risk with access issues. For some, the road out of the pandemic has more challenges. Thomas Dagg, the CBC News, Toronto. Alberta will begin vaccinating 15,000 workers at meatpacking plants across the province this week. Outbreaks at meatpacking facilities have resulted in hundreds of positive cases in the province and at least three deaths. Vaccines will now be made available to workers at 136 plants through a combination of on-site and community vaccination sites. Well, the first Johnson & Johnson vaccines, 300,000 doses are set to arrive this week. And Health Canada says the label for the one-shot vaccine will include a warning to reflect the possible side effects, including the rare risk of blood clotting. Similar to AstraZeneca, Health Canada says the benefits of the vaccine, though, outweigh the very rare potential risks. And the United States says it's planning to send its entire stockpile of AstraZeneca vaccines to other countries. The White House says it could export as many as 60 million doses in the coming weeks, though we don't yet know how many of those doses might be coming to Canada specifically. Well, in India, the COVID-19 situation is nothing short of a catastrophe. After hitting a first wave high of fewer than 100,000 daily cases back in the fall, the infection rate did come back down at a similar pace. But the new wave is unlike anything seen anywhere else. Day after day, it shatters records. And now the country is seeing more than 350,000 cases every day. Susanna De Silva shows us frightening scenes from the country, the desperate attempts to slow the spread, and the Canadians stranded. There is no time or room to say a proper goodbye anymore. Parks are now makeshift mass cremation sites. Many of these people never even had a chance to survive COVID. Unable to get help or forced to get help in the back of a car. We do not have enough oxygen to supply to our patients and then to see our patients, you know, literally suffocating to their death in front of our eyes, it's really very heart-wrenching. Military aircraft and trains are being used to try and get scarce oxygen supplies around the country. But it isn't coming fast enough. This man's mother is inside. He says the oxygen supply is unreliable and last night her mask fell off, but no one came to help. She called him desperate, but they wouldn't let him in. Indian health officials now recommending people wear masks at home. And as of next week, they're dropping the vaccine eligibility age to 18. But today, this mass clinic in Mumbai ran out of shots. The U.S. says it is sending PPE and equipment, and Canada has pledged to help too, if asked. We have to start thinking about other ways to support colleagues and our families and communities in India around, for example, medical missions. All the news frightening for those here with family in India, 
where some Canadians are desperate to come home. You know, worried and scared for their lives. And Shivi Darubra's mother rushed from Ontario to India after her father was in a serious car accident a few weeks ago. He was in the process of packing his things to move to Canada permanently. But last week's flight ban means Darubra's mother and her grandparents are unable to leave, too frail to try to take connecting flights through other countries. Bring back the citizens who flew for emergency reasons, had all their paperwork in place. For now, families like hers can only wait and watch the worsening crisis. Susanna De Silva, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, a move from Apple tonight aims to give you back control of your personal data. This is something that privacy advocates have been asking for for years. Ahead on the national, why Facebook is promising a fight. Oh, from concert crowds to summer travel, other countries plan a new normal. What about Canada? And a little boy with cerebral palsy gets his hockey dream with a little help. Thank you a lot. Now I got the opportunity to play hockey because of you. The one-of-a-kind solution that made it possible. We're back in two. Well, night skies are being lit up as the first supermoon of 2021 rises around the globe tonight. The full moon uh, is a supermoon because it's at one of its closest points to Earth. The extra large moon glowed over landmarks in Turkey and lit up Australia's iconic Bondi Beach. Forecasters say another supermoon will light up night skies next month. Well, a battle in the tech world tonight over your data. Apple released new software today that puts customer privacy front and center. If you use an iPhone, for example, you will be asked to decide whether your apps can track and sell your browsing record. As Jacqueline Hansen shows us, that's got Facebook steamed. It's the new app tracking transparency prompt. Apple is giving users a clear and obvious new choice to block an app from tracking their activity or allow it. This is something that privacy advocates have been asking for for years. For months, Facebook has publicly campaigned against Apple's move. The Apple iOS update has the potential of bringing a big portion of my business to a screeching halt. If an Apple user says no to tracking, a company like Facebook won't be able to access their activity on other apps and websites. Data that it uses to build detailed virtual profiles to sell targeted advertising. Technology Facebook's business model relies on and some small businesses too. I don't know where my business would be if I wasn't able to run a personalized ad. But many users likely don't even know their data is being tracked, collected or used. And Apple wants them to. Your information is for sale. You have become the product. Many people will be shocked to hear that Facebook and Google, for example, have their trackers embedded in all sorts of applications that they don't even own. A shock for some, but for more than a decade, DuckDuckGo has built a business on offering privacy. Its search engine automatically blocks tracking. Certainly, we, we wish these sort of changes would have been in place years ago, but I, I think now's the time, uh, better late than never. Deep in Apple's settings, users could previously opt out, but now the option will be in your face, a pop-up for each app that wants permission. The sample Apple provided also in your face to Facebook. The law and policies will only get us, to a, get us to a certain point. The rest of the way is all of us collectively working together to understand that privacy should be front and center. A new push for digital privacy now literally in users' hands. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. Well, Alberta and Ontario are the hardest hit by Canada's third wave. So next, I'm going to speak with two mayors from hotspots in those provinces about what went wrong and what they'll need to get out of this crisis. And later, one family shares their story to help understand the history of black Canadians on the prairies. Well, the pandemic throws a daily spotlight on federal and provincial leaders, but the pain of COVID flare-up strikes hardest right where we live. In Alberta, the regional municipality of Wood Buffalo, that's the Fort McMurray area, declared a state of emergency last night. With outbreaks in places like oil sands, work camps, businesses, daycare centers. Across Alberta, generally, there are about 25 active cases per 10,000 people. But in Wood Buffalo, it's more than five times that. Also, in Ontario... 
The city of Brampton stands out with two and a half times the province's per capita caseload. So for a better picture of what these two regions are dealing with and what they need to improve things, we're going to bring in two mayors, Mayor Patrick Brown, the mayor of Brampton, and Mayor Don Scott, who is the mayor of Wood Buffalo. Hello to the two of you. Evening. Good to be with you. Mayor Scott, can I start with you? I mean, we went through a bit of the, the numbers there, but, but how would you make it crystal clear to someone like me living in Ontario how serious the situation is where you live? You know, we have the most cases per capita in Alberta, and we are number three by the numbers in Alberta. Uh, but in real terms, uh, there is a very serious concern about what's happening in this region. We have 1,086 cases. Uh, for 70,000 in population. So, you know, I, it's something that is on everybody's mind in this region. Just so I'm clear, this, this third wave makes what you experienced in the second wave seem more like a ripple, right? This is by far the worst it's ever been? Absolutely. It's uh, way beyond anything that we've experienced previously. And we went through some of the who in terms of who is getting sick, but what is your understanding of how transmission is happening in your area? It's one of the challenges is that we have not been given the information by the provincial government or by any other source. So we really do not know what's driving the, the health concern in our region. And that's one of, the, one of the reasons that we declared the state of emergency is we need to start getting the information from other levels of government. Uh, since we declared the state of emergency last night, I've had a discussion with the premier, uh, which I would say is very positive. And we've spoken with the federal minister of health uh, about two hours ago. So. I think things are moving in a positive direction that we will be getting help, we will be uh, getting the information that we think will help make a difference in this region. But that, that sounds pretty alarming to me, that, that at this stage of the game you're, you're, you're unsure of how transmission is predominantly happening in your region? Yeah, there's been a lot of uh, people making different statements, but nobody has given me the evidence about uh, what has been happening. I understand the Premier made some statements today uh, about what the source might be, but no one has called me, uh, either from the Minister of Health or otherwise, uh, and said, this is what we believe is driving the cause in your region. And everybody is left to guess, which is not helping, and they're filling the, the void with uh, you know, uncertainty. And that's, uh, that's not helping the, the mindset of the region, certainly. We're going to talk a little bit more about what your region needs uh, in just a moment. But Mayor Brown, for uh, Canadians who aren't as familiar with, with Brampton as, as you or I are, I mean, I, I saw it described earlier this week as a complex cacophony of communities, uh, meaning that it's, it's a pretty different part of the province th th you know, than the rest of it uh, stands. How would you describe how dire the situation is and why that is? Well, it's a very challenging situation right now in Brampton. We have a positivity rate of 22%, which is the highest in the province of Ontario. And it's not because people are out there socializing. It's really the nature of the work environment. Our two largest sectors are the food processing sector and the transportation logistics sector. And despite all the lockdowns, those sectors have never been closed down. These are busy, active factories. And um, everyone in Canada benefits from their contribution to the supply chain. And you know, if you get a package that's sent, it likely goes through Brampton. And if you have groceries, it's likely processed in Brampton from coast to coast. But that means there's a lot of essential workers who go to work every day at great risk. And what we're seeing, we know where the spread's happening. We've had over 400 workplace outbreaks, and workplace outbreaks leads to community spread, and unfortunately, it's having real, real consequences in our community. How optimistic are you that it can be controlled in the short term, in the sense that I, I'm, I know that with the Peel Health region in particular, of which Brampton is a part, there is the invocation of Section 22, which allows some measure of control over which workplaces can stay open, particularly those that have had outbreaks. We know the Premier of Ontario, Doug Ford, has signaled that there may be something coming in terms of paid sick leave. How optimistic are you? Well, I think the Section 22 order is going to help, and, and that's very unique. Our local health unit didn't want to wait on help from federal or provincial governments, and so we issued an order where these factories um, are, are ordered to close if they have five or more linked cases in a two-week period. And historically, throughout this pandemic, uh, federal and provincial officials have said you can't close these factories. They're too integral to Canada's supply chain. Uh, but our medical officer, health doctor, Lawrence Lowe, said no business, no corporation, no matter how large, is more important than the health of our residents. So I believe that move, that bold move, is going to make a difference. But 
Beyond that, we need to vaccinate our essential workers. We need to have a focus on hotspots. We need paid sick days. And you know, there's talk that those measures are going to come. That that help is going to come. But until it does, you know, we've we've got some, you know, choppy waters ahead. Right. So 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 what do you need then? Because as you've just pointed out, a lot of these things have been signaled in the sense that the the premier does finally seem like he is at a point where he wants to make some of those things happen. Are you just in a, in a waiting pattern now, or is there something more proactively that on a local level you feel like you can do? Well, we're told our vaccine allocation is going to go up in the month of May. Unfortunately, at the start of this pandemic, the vaccine allocation was about equity and fairness. So every city, every province was going to get the same amount of vaccines. That doesn't work for a community like Brampton because this, this virus isn't equitable and fair. It attacks a densely populated area faster than it does a rural area. It, it, it attacks a crowded factory in a different manner than it would an executive working from home. And so we've needed a larger share of vaccines. You need to focus on where the fire is. And so once we get those vaccines, it's going to make a difference, um, but it won't show up immediately. Uh, un unfortunately, the, the damage is done right now. We're seeing escalating case numbers. We've seen tragedies that are difficult to, um, to, to handle as a community. Um, but with that help, with vaccines, um, you know, there will be better days ahead. Mayor Scott. What do you need? Uh, one of the things we've talked to other levels of government about immediately is vaccine supply. Uh, just as Mayor Brown stated, we think that, and we've been hearing from uh, health officials that that's going to be the solution long term. So one of the things about this, this region is we are a large, diverse region. Uh, we're bigger than Nova Scotia in this region. A lot of people don't realize that, but we are a young population. And a lot of people are not eligible for the vaccines that are available right now. So we need to open up the eligibility in this region if it's going to make a difference. So I believe that that's the, probably the number one thing that's going to make a difference. Before I let you go, though, are, are vaccines going to make a difference in the short term? Because that, I mean, the, the benefit of that, you will only really start to materialize a few weeks out. And it sounds like your region has a problem today. Yeah, uh, but that's going to be the long-term solution. What's going to make a difference today is... You know, getting the information we need and implementing solutions that will make an immediate difference. But the key to that is going to be getting the information. I do have to leave it there, uh, mayors, but very good to hear from both of you. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate okay. it. My pleasure. All the best. And next, a look at the journey taken by some of the first black Canadians on the prairies. They risked everything moving across a border. One family's role in building one of the largest black settlements in Canada. Plus, it doesn't make a difference if we make it all night. This was Saturday in New Zealand, and other countries are already getting ready for a new normal. Believe it or not, we will show you how. Welcome back. Tonight, we bring you a special CBC project that shines new light on the black experience on Canada's prairies. That's where you'll find the country's fastest growing black population. It has quadrupled in just 20 years. But while most are first generation, the black presence on the prairies stretches back to the 18th century. Omera Issa of CBC Saskatoon uses one family's story to show us that rich history and today's reality. My great-grandfather, Henry Sneed, is buried here. He died in 1914. Ron Mapp has been to this spot many times growing up as a boy. My grandmother is buried here. His family goes back six generations in Alberta. It all started here in Amber Valley over 100 years ago, and it wasn't an easy journey. My great-grandfather, Henry Sneed, led the original scouting party up here along with uh, two other scouts. They liked the land and they decided to bring up the other families from Oklahoma. Amber Valley was the largest and most prosperous black settlement west of Ontario. It had a school, a church and a famous baseball team. Ron now lives in Edmonton and has two grown children and two grandchildren. While they didn't grow up in Amber Valley, the Mapp family history is something Ron has been passing along to his children for years. I heard a lot of stories from my father um, and my, my uncle when I was young. 
Um, I spent a lot of time in Amber Valley on the farm, um, sometimes weeks and months at a time. While the Mapp family feels connected to its past in Alberta, it was a painful lesson for Mapp's great-grandfather, Henry Sneed, learning that Canada wasn't as welcoming as he'd hoped. Growing up in uh, USA and Texas and Oklahoma, going through Jim Crow and seeing all the racial discrimination and to bring his family and other families up here hoping that they wouldn't have to endure the same hardships. Only four months after Henry Sneed settled in Alberta, Prime Minister Wilfrid Laurier signed an order in council prohibiting black migration for one year suggesting that black people were deemed unsuitable to the climate and requirements of Canada. Within a year of this order, black migration slowed almost to a halt across the country, contributing to a racist and isolating environment for black Canadians who had already made their way here. When the Canadian governments invited Americans, they didn't think that African Americans would answer the call, and they did. Karina Vernon has been studying the history and impact of black people on the prairies for decades. They risked everything, moving across a border into a territory that they had no idea where they were coming. They'd heard that there was greater freedom under, under the Canadian flag. What they found was, of course, a mixture of freedom, but of also complications. This year, Canada Post issued a stamp to honor Henry Sneed and Amber Valley. The stamp depicts Sneed standing tall along with other prominent community members of the time. To take on such an endeavor to bring the families from Oklahoma up to Western Canada. This is my grandfather. Ron Mapp hopes his family's story and other black families' legacy on the prairies will be taught in schools across the country to recognize their place in Canada. For now, though, Ron and his family continue to celebrate their roots. Amber Valley is home. No matter where I go, Amber Valley will always be home. Omera Isa, CBC News, Amber Valley, Alberta. Now this story is part of the Black on the Prairies project. It includes a collection of stories for television and the web, personal essays, photography, much more. You can check it all out at cbc.ca slash black on the prairies. Well, for most of us, getting through this pandemic means daydreaming about a future that looks an awful lot like the past. Oh, Up next, something that might get you singing. A taste of post-COVID life abroad and when it might happen here. Well, it may seem like a dream, but there are parts of the world where life is slowly starting to return to normal. Whether it's thanks to high vaccination rates or strict health measures, millions of people are doing things that most of us haven't done in over a year, like going to festivals, even traveling. So what does life look like on the other side? And how close are we to joining the club? Here's David Kahn. It doesn't make a difference if we make it all. Oh yeah, no big deal. Just 50,000 fans and zero masks last weekend. Having capped COVID cases with extreme lockdowns, this is New Zealand's reward. And you know what, Canada? Well, not quite halfway, but we are well on our way. Having uh, everybody getting the vaccine, that is a massive step towards uh, returning to uh, a no more normal uh, life. With at least 10 million shots arriving in Canada over the next month, even more in June, when everybody should have been able to get that first dose, Canadians can now do some post-pandemic dreaming. Maybe even travel. EU nations will allow fully immunized Americans to visit this summer. And the European Commission tells us Canadians may soon be eligible too. The British, meanwhile, about two months ahead of Canada in vaccinations, are already relaxing restrictions. It's been absolutely amazing, isn't it? Like we've all had a great time, it's been lovely. Over in Denmark, 
Want to eat inside? No prob. An app on your phone shows proof of the shot or of a recent negative test. Oh, when show business is betting, it'll be back to business. Alanis Morissette planning to tour again starting in Toronto in July. And both Dua Lipa and Elton John in the UK in September. But the real craving may just be this. It's so good to see you. <laughs> Australia and New Zealand reopening their border with COVID well in control. There is indeed hope on the horizon that this is coming to Canada. David Coleman, CBC News, Toronto. Well, there's certainly no guarantee that things will be back to normal by the summer, but Canada's tourism sector is getting ready. Diane Buckner shows us what's in the works from coast to coast. It's being called Canada's first wine village. 16 small, interesting little producers with all different personalities, stories. The $25 million project in BC's Okanagan Valley is slated to open in June, when they hope the province's travel ban is lifted, inviting travel-starved visitors to enjoy food, wine, and live music. There's clearly lots of pent-up demand to do things, especially something that's safe and outdoors. In downtown Toronto, another new attraction is set to open, Little Canada, a $25 million miniature version of the country. It's a massive undertaking. The, the country's too big uh, to build all at once, even in miniature. Years in development, it's supposed to launch this summer. But no question, 2021 is a tricky time to launch a venture dependent on tourists. Lockdowns have kept international visitors out, an industry loss of $19 billion. Revenue from domestic tourism is also down due to COVID capacity limits. Half a million workers have lost their jobs. Some won't ever be back. So many of them have had to move on to other industries in order to continue to feed their families and keep a roof over their head. But it doesn't make business sense to abandon new destinations that have been in the works for years, like this one in Cape Breton, a $100 million year-round resort that will include a tree walk and a ski hill. A July 1st grand opening is set for the gondola. If we don't prepare and we kind of put this project on the freeze, uh, well, that would be heartbreaking for for many people. The operators of Canada's new ventures hope better days are just around the corner. What's our hope if the vaccines keep rolling out quickly? They expect the new attractions will bring in local visitors and save some of what should be their peak season until travelers from elsewhere are able to return. Diane Buckner, CBC News, Toronto. Okay, when we come back, a solution to get a hockey-loving kid on the ice. Because of his cerebral palsy, he can't put the fingers in the glove, but he can, he can use a mitt. You don't want to hear this one. Our moment is next. Well, Carter Burton of Kings Point, Newfoundland, loves hockey, but he's been a fan instead of a player because his cerebral palsy makes it tough to wear a glove. Until now. A retired engineering prof caught wind of his story and whipped up a custom design. Their story is our moment. I just love hockey. And I'm learning lots of new stuff because of him. We uh, basically design assistive devices for people with disabilities. Things that are not available in the marketplace. So all I know was that he had this special form of cerebral palsy. Because of his cerebral palsy, he can't put the fingers in the glove, but he can, he can use a mitt. He cut the finger holes out and sewed it together, so I just need to put my thumb out and then I'm ready to go. I'm so happy that it worked out. This is exactly what we are here for, to help people like this, right? And uh, to see him so happy and to, uh, to be able to make use of it. Thank you a lot. Now I got the opportunity to play hockey because of you. So first of all, major props to the Tetra Society for doing this kind of volunteer work. But the part about this story that I love is that, you know, Leonard says it wasn't a huge deal. It was about two weeks maybe of, of brainstorming and problem solving and liaising with Carter's therapist to figure out how best to solve that problem. 
But at the end of the day, it's not a life or death thing. It was just one human doing a small thing, not so small thing for another human. That's The National for this April 26th. Have a great night.